how you doing? This is John, and welcome to John's Long Box. We're here live with DG Chichester. How Hello, John. Hello, I'm great. It's it's actually Chichester. Um, yes, but, yes, but, that's my thing. I mispronounce everybody's names and embarrass myself. Dan, this is Dan, now the we, ninth time. Uh, we kept it. We kept the tradition going, and and please make it Dan. DG is my pretentious uh, stage name, so okay, we're, we're Dan. good. It, it's it's good to have. Thank you for coming uh, coming by. Uh, uh, Dan and I were already talking before we went live that we're both board game freaks. So that that that's a good it was a good bonding moment. Yes, yeah. I think you I think you outshine me, but I'm 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 willing to catch up. So well, I'm a compulsive <laughs> person. Comic book collectors are compulsive, obsessive, you know what I mean? So I, I, I got I got too many comic books, I got too many board games, and my wife makes fun of me because three quarters of them are still in shrink wrap. You know, I read <laughs> rules online, so there's no need to get them dirty with my fingerprints until I'm actually ready to play them. <laughs> My my wife is a is a compulsive knitter, and she has, uh, you know, skeins of yarn that she's. I can't touch that. I can't even look at that. That's that's just no. That's no. I bought it. I can't use it. It's just, yeah, I know I've, exactly what every, you're talking about. Everybody has their compulsion. It's always good. Yeah, I got I got pencils over here that that they feel too good to be used. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. I can't I can't use that pen. What? I can't use this pencil. This pencil feels right. if I use it, it's gonna go away. So right. it's gonna sit in this drawer for 30 years, never to be used. <laughs> I'm <a> person. <laughs> so you know, you, for those of you, I always try to treat each video just like Marvel Comics used to do. Every every video, every comic was somebody's first time here. So totally. so uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Excellent. Uh, everybody out there, I'm Dan Chichester, uh, mostly known, usually known as DG Chichester in comics and really not known in comics probably beyond 98, 99. I worked extensively in comics from about 1982, 83 through about 99, uh, primarily for Marvel, uh, beginning as an editor uh, at the Epic uh, Division, which is kind of forgotten at this point, but was a pretty oh, not important. Not by me. Not by you, <laughs> but uh, a pretty important imprint. Uh, one of the first creator-owned uh, imprints, certainly by a major publisher. So we did a lot of uh, great eclectic uh, comics uh, like Moonshadow and Martial Law and Grew the Wanderer and and, and ElfQuest extension, uh, uh, Keith Giffen's titles. Video Jack. Um, brought over the first uh, editions of Akira to the to the states, um, and also did some Marvel-oriented, uh, more mature versions of Marvel titles like Electro Assassin. Uh, which, uh, you know, was really groundbreaking, you know, certainly yes. for its time. So I was an editor there for many years. And then um, as I transitioned off staff, I, I moved into what I really wanted to do, which was writing. So I, I became the writer on Nick Fury, um, uh, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, for a good run. I was a writer on Hellraiser and Nightbreed, uh, Clive Barker titles, yeah. which I had actually started while I was an editor. Um, moved over to uh, Night Stalkers, which was... Uh, part of Marvel's uh, sort of horror run of of books under the Midnight Suns, and um, probably most uh, famously or infamously, depending if you liked the run or not, uh, my run on Daredevil, uh, you know, took us into uh, 300 with the Fall of the Kingpin, uh, with Lee Weeks, and then uh, later I would do uh, Fall from Grace, which was a um, and and the Shadow Lie the Terror. Oh my God, the deep cuts. I love it. Yeah. Um, you, thank you, you find Tony. That people who like my my show tend to like all the deep cuts and you know thank you thank you tony those are two faves of mine which not everybody knows about or brings up but uh but as i was saying daredevil you know uh, uh had a, i think a good run on that um fall from grace was a uh was a good run and then i moved out of comics um as the comics market kind of collapsed around the mid 90s yeah, uh, yeah there were quite as many time. opportunities and i put a lot of my energies into uh, into something else, moving into kind of marketing and, and advertising. Um, but uh, but recently, kind of coming back around to comics right now with a, a, a Kickstarter that I'm doing that's below my name, which is a big supernatural thriller called Axel's Infernal. And thank you, John, for putting that that link You're right welcome. there. Anything to help. Anything and, th to help. and then um, uh, I was asked um, uh, about a summer, a year and a half ago by Marvel to kind of come back and do a mini series uh, for Daredevil, uh, which is kind of a retro uh, 90s title uh, called Daredevil Black Armor, where we're putting Daredevil back in this Black Armor costume that came out of Fall from Grace. Um, so that's a long winded intro uh, of who I am. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you had the very unenviable 
uh, job of following up Frank Miller and Anacenti. You know, that yes, that everybody else would have collapsed under under that. Very question. well, you know, that's the hubris of youth, right? You know, <laughs> when I won the title, which is insanely young, and um, and I was definitely intimidated by both, but also inspired by both. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I was not gonna certainly out Miller Miller or out Ann Ann, <laughs> you know, but um, but I felt uh, inspired by the work they had done and I in, had come to enjoy the character more through their stories. So um, here was an opportunity to play at a higher level than I really thought I was ready for. I'll be a, oh really? Yeah. You know, I didn't I didn't think I was ready for that level of a book. But when so were you asked to do it or did you petition to do it? No, I had a pitch. I, I uh, it, it the book I, I found out a little bit ahead of uh, Anne leaving that she was going to be leaving. Uh, a friend of mine had had heard that she was, uh, you know, going off the title. And uh, and he's the one who convinced me, a guy named Steve Busolato. He's the one who convinced me to to talk to Ralph Macchio, who was the editor. Um, he said, Ralph really likes your work on other stuff. You know, he you know, he likes you. Why don't you pitch the book? But I, I pitched it. I had to write a proposal, and this is what I was going to do, and and here's the approach I'm going to take. And uh, and I know I was up against other people. I don't know all of the names, but it wasn't like I was the only uh, <laughs> proposal on Ralph's desk. Uh, and and out of um, you know, kind of like a, a blue sky, this bolt of lightning came down. And Ralph called me and said, "Hey, you, you're the new writer. <laughs> uh, now, now go, um, go, and, go, hit the ground running." Yeah, yeah. You, and and you, what what I like about your run is it was it was unique, but you didn't dismiss or, or hand wave any of the past. You know, you, you you took what and built on. I always say that comic books are like a Lego sculpture. The next yeah. guy puts a couple of Legos. On. I, you know, I can't stay when they knock the Legos away and then start all no, over again. You know, no, I, yeah. I mean, I think if there's no. something really, really bad or there's just nothing there, you know, or, or things have been left um, to kind of rot where people haven't paid attention to it. I think maybe one of the more famous examples of that is uh, is uh, Alan Moore's Swamp Thing, you know, where where the book had sort of been left alone and the character had sort of been pushed to the side and and he came in and introduced his own things to it in a really radical way. Yeah. But when there's when there's positive things there, I think that you honor the character and you honor again the people that inspired me by trying to build on what they did. Um, I wish I'd been a more mature writer uh, and maybe just more mature person. Then I would like to have built more on the work that Anne did, which I enjoyed, but I I didn't have the I'm going to just say the maturity to key into it in the same way that I do now. Um, but I always like building on what people have done. And as you said, finding your own spin on it. Right? right. And then it becomes more yours. You're, you're, you're off and running after a point. Yeah. When you look, when you look back at the history of like, like say X-Men or something like that, you look at, Oh, that that's Claremont's X-Men that, that, you know, mm -hmm. that stands X-Men or, you know, that's, you know, I'm trying, I'm thinking of other, but, it's all the X Men, you know. It's all a a, a continuous story, but right. there's, there's little spins up, and that's like I said, I, I I always had a dream for for writing for Marvel, and if they said, "Oh, you're gonna you're gonna take over Daredevil after Frank Miller and Andrew Senti," I would have been like, you know, I think I'm gonna go back and take. <laughs> <laughs> so I gotta give you all the credit in the world. <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't know that I ever thought about it quite that way. Um, and oh, uh, I mean, I'm a now, big fan. now you now you've made me feel like, wait a minute, what was I doing? Um, well, you, but, well, good. It's good. Good. You, you did a good job. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you said, the the the, uh, the, the uh, hubris of youth, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Hey, Lacey. But, hey, hey, Lacey, it's good to see you back. Haven't seen you in a while. So, uh, yeah, you were editor of Epic. And I have to say, I've been championing Epic Comics on my channel for the past three years. I've been showcasing a lot of Epic Comics. I thought they were a very important line of comics. I thought they, uh, they were... Uh, pushing the standard of comics. I thought they yes, raised. Thank and you. I, and you, you were one of the editors. So, you know, that that's, you know, I, I thought I, like Moonshadow, you brought that up. I had JMD Mate, uh, Mateus. I've been saying his name wrong for 20 years. He, he, well, he, he he's it. saying it a little differently now these days, <laughs> but, oh, okay. but he gets, he gets to say it any way he wants. It's his yeah, name. It's, it's so. the Mandela effect then, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> but um, but no, Moonshadow was a tone poem, right? And Margaret right. Clark was the editor on that, and uh, and Moonshadow was one of those comics I would give to people who said I don't like comics, exactly. like you know, and and I would hand Moonshadow to them, and I would say, read this, then come back and tell me. And they might not like anything else beyond Moonshadow, but a right. book like Moonshadow gave them um, a chance to appreciate comics, and that's what I feel deeply privileged you know to have been part of with those epic books was that we you know we had a very eclectic line of titles right they ran a huge gamut of genres right, and approaches you had fantasy yeah but i i think that you know we gave creators uh an opportunity to uh to explore things that they wouldn't have otherwise underneath the umbrella of a publisher who they knew was going to be able to carry it out for them and uh and for myself being an editor in that way working to support um creators visions i i think uh, made me a different better editor and then made me think about writing and telling stories in a different way when i finally got around to, to doing that were you a, a little kid reading comics saying one day i'm gonna i'm gonna write daredevil <laughs> I was I was I was a little kid. Well, I was always a big kid, but I was a I was a little kid um, reading comics voraciously. My cousin uh, Mark, uh, to get me out of his way, had dumped a barrel, not a box, a barrel of comics. A literal barrel. On me. Literal barrel. Literal round <laughs> barrel. He was a figure. You know, of without, you know, an old barrel. Mad magazines, tons of comics. None of them were well cared for. It's just a jumble. It's like, here, take these and stop bothering me. You know, stop. He's older, <laughs> older than I was, and I kind of like then idolize him. But you know, you looked up to that older cousin, and to get me out of his hair, you know, he dumped this barrel of comics on me, and um, so that's where I remember really hooking me. And then from there, you know, I was the kid who would ride the bike across, you know, busy traffic. Um, you know, a couple miles from from home to the nearest newsstand at that point every every week to, uh, you know, get the little brown bag of of comics. Yeah. And uh, and mostly DCs. I, I, it was my initials, I guess. Uh, but I really didn't gravitate to, to Marvels at all. But I read them voraciously. I, I collected them not in, you know, long boxes or smart things like that. I just emptied out my dressers. And yep, I put did that the comics too. in there. You know the co the clothes were all over the floor. Yeah, and the and the comics I were. Socks, I can stay on the floor. Yeah, yeah exactly. If it lives there, exactly. <laughs> but the comics they need to be stacked carefully in the in yeah. the dressers, and and you know and I I did that to um, probably I was like 13, 14, and then I stopped. I don't know why. You know I can't remember. There wasn't like a definitive thing, or you know I said yeah. oh I, I don't like comics anymore. I went um, through the existential crisis too. I can't like kid stuff anymore. I'm, I'm a, I don't I'm even a, know if it was that. It just it just felt like you know it just I just stopped going, uh, and um, and then it wasn't until the the I got the job at Marvel, which I got while I was in still in school, and and there was a job posting at the the school, uh, you know, the student employment office, if you if you will, and it was like, hey, typist at Marvel Comics, and I'm still in school at this point. So I'm thinking to myself, well, I type really fast. And if you're going to type somewhere, Marvel Comics sounds like a pretty cool place. And even though I hadn't read the Marvels, I knew everything, right? I knew enough by osmosis to go in there and I knew exactly who the Hulk was and who Spider-Man was and who Thor was. And the, I, I could tell you the origin stories. And I, I, the job that was offered, I didn't get, but I ended up getting the job at, of, the assistant to the assistant to the editor in chief. So I'm right outside Jim Shooter's office, listening to him, you know, tell his tales of wisdom. So it wasn't something I aspired to, but uh, it ended up being something that, um, you know, fates aligned. And and when I got there, um, I, I had a good synergy with uh, with the stories and the worlds right away. And I still wasn't thinking I was going to work there any length of time. My, my goal was, I had been in film school, my goal was make a little bit of money, graduate from school, and then head west, young man, type oh, of thing. Okay. Uh, so it wasn't, movies? yeah, it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't until a couple of years later that, you know, I, I started to realize, well, this is kind of a career now, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, 
it, how how is I take it you enjoyed working at, at in the Marvel offices back then? Um, yeah, I think it was real lightning in a bottle times. I mean, I yeah, I don't I know imagine. what it is nowadays, but we had such a terrific group of people and and the freelancers who were coming in and out were names that I I knew from reading those comics. You know, Bernie Wrightson, you know, walks into the office, you know, uh, Walt Simonson. I'm I'm working for Archie Goodwin. You know, he's he's my boss. Uh, so uh, and and the attitude was exactly what you you expect it from reading, you know, a Stan soapbox. Right. The attitude yeah, yeah. of the Marvel bullpen was uh, energetic and, you know, breaking out in 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 Nerf gun wars. That's what I pictured in my head as a kid. Yeah, paint, more, more, more paint, like paint. Monkey swinging around. Yeah. And uh, ball fights, you know. <laughs> Jim, Jim Novak, when he was running the, the, the production arm of the bullpen, you know, had a giant loudspeaker, you know, outside his office that he'd, you know, broadcast, you know, faux edicts out, you know, into the, into the space. Um, uh, crazy costume parties, you know, for Halloween. It was, uh, it was business, but it was a lot of that energy and every editor, editor's office had a different uh, attitude um and so it 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 was a great group of people and i recognize now even more because i i had not gone to conventions in a long time and and now i go back and i see a lot of the people that i i knew then and i i connect with them right away That's and great. they connect with me and i think that was a, a again a testament to a, a unique group of people being together uh, at the right time and, and, and they all love this basically childish stuff, you know what I mean? So I guess they must have had like a playful demeanor about them, you know? Yeah, and and I I think that that's part of it, and I think they just took the business of of storytelling seriously. You know, they they looked at what they were doing as as not childish in the sense of it's a business. Oh, oh, I can do yeah, I can do this with my left hand, and who's going to pay attention? You know, it was real serious discussions about how things worked and why they worked and why characters would do certain things or not do certain things. Um, and, uh, I, I, you know, people had to be um, excited about it on their own in the hopes that readers would be excited about it. Right. Yeah. If you're not excited writing it, making it, you know. Right. Right. I'm not going to get excited reading it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right about that. So uh, you mentioned Ar Archie Goodwood. So uh, I, I've been here, you know, I, I, didn't realize and, and, until I started buying back issues of Creepy and Eerie and right. he, the editor of, of these legendary Warren magazines. Oh, yeah. 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 So, I mean, I didn't realize, like, I, I I think I've started paying attention to his name in the epic line, but he. Okay. So, and everybody says that he was the greatest guy in, in, in comics of all time. Do you have any was, uh, anecdotes? He had to be pretty, he had to be pretty close. And, and yeah. you know, that was certainly again one of the magic moments for me was i knew his names from exactly those you know yeah. creepy warren archie goodwin writes this archie goodwin edits this one of my favorite comics that i picked up as a kid um at, at a bookstore you know was the uh the uh, graphic novel uh adaptation of alien that he and walt simonson worked on together oh, yeah, good huge stuff. alien fan and that was a great adaptation and oh who are these guys walt simonson archie goodwin um, so to walk into the office when I went in to interview for the Epic job, uh, and it's Archie Goodwin, it's like, you know, you're making these connections. Wait a minute. This is a real guy. <laughs> and, um, you know, fiercely committed to, in front of me, you know, he's standing in front of me. Right. He's offering me candy from the candy jar on his desk. Um, uh, hysterically funny, you know, man, uh, warm man, uh, ferocious temper. If, um, really, if people, if people sort of broke their word on things you not 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 a temper to you know flare up at the wrong moments but if um but if uh you know something wasn't uh done to the standards you know he could he could you know you, you didn't want those moments to happen you know because right. they were so far few and far between but when they happened you, you knew it was it was yeah, a time just to pay attention. Just those Warren magazines and Epic. You knew he had high standards. Oh, very high standards. Yeah, and some... and every but but he was you know I think often cited as the nicest guy in comics, but his demeanor and his approach was generally humorous, uh, gentle, not not like a lamb, but you know friendly, and everybody wanted to work for Archie and with Archie. So that was our secret weapon at Epic was 
everybody wanted to work for Archie Goodwin. And that would get us incredible titles like, you know, martial law or uh, Mobius, you know, wanting to do, you know, his work uh, through Epic or, um, or uh, you know, Frank Miller and Bill Sienkiewicz wanting to do a title like Electra Assassin uh, through that imprint. Um, and uh, and um, I just learned so much from watching uh, how he would do things. Uh, I don't think everybody, anybody would ever call me the nicest guy in comics, but but, <laughs> but I think in terms of standards, I I learned about keeping the standards high and keeping your pact with the people who are working with you, you know, and that you are maybe the shepherd or the guide or the navigator for um, other people that you're collaborating with uh, to make a project work either in comics or, or in other lines of business that I've been in. So, you know, you, you, I think it's, it's fair to say that Daredevil was your, was your most known, but you had your own stuff. You had St. George, which I, I collected. Mm -hmm. uh, you had, you had uh, Dr. Zero, which I remember, you know, mm -hmm. power line uh, was the, uh, power was the line, yes, of those power shadow line. line books. Yep. And, mm -hmm. and this was all creator owned. So you, 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 do you own those? Do no, those those were actually Archie created those three oh, okay. concepts. So he he one of Archie's thoughts was because the epic line was so diverse and so eclectic and so stretched out, we didn't really have an identity like say Vertigo did, right? Vertigo did a lot of similarly high quality titles, like high quality, I mean, in terms of production values and better paper and better printing and uh, a lot of illustrated or painterly art, but Vertigo titles, ver Vertigo titles, um, you know, generally had an identity, a theme. They were, you know, the darker, mysterious. That was yeah. kind of their vibe. Um, Epic could be everything from the moon shadow tone poem to the ferocious martial law to the ridiculousness of Gru the Wanderer, right? So we're all over the place, which is good, but is also hard for people to identify what epic is so archie thought if we came up with a mini universe of superhero titles it might get more attention on the line so okay. he created these three concepts um you know wrote them up and described them and talked about how they interrelated under the shadow line umbrella uh the shadow line being a race of hidden powered uh, uh humanoids and uh and then out of again lightning coming from the sky he turns to me and Margaret Clark, who was the woman I was, uh, another editor from, from Epic, but we had been writing together um, and trying to kind of find a, a groove and get hired on different titles. Um, he turns to us and he says, I want you two to write all three titles, which we were, who are you talking to? You know, we're looking <laughs> over our shoulder. Look, you must be speaking to somebody else. What, what's going on here? And um, so he trusted us to take those ideas that he had put together and then from that point, I would say we we kind of co-created those, okay. you know, if you will, because but but they were owned and are owned by by Marvel, right? Because okay. he created them for Marvel um, under his uh, you, you know role with Marvel. Uh, they were owned by the company and are owned by the company. They haven't done anything with them. Uh, yeah, I would love to see that too. There was a lot of great stuff, Tony. Um, yeah, there was. There was. I, um, I, I, I'm a I, like I said, I'm a big champion of, of the epic line of comics. I mean, yeah, Elf, yeah. Elf Quest, I think was what because I was like, if it ain't superheroes, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And, <laughs> and I and I think Elf Quest opened me up to like, wow, this Co is yeah, Elf Quest, like it's yeah, it's a world unto itself, right? It's right. it's a, a gigantic mythology, you know. It's right. uh, and it was and, different from Tolkien. I was like, I'm not reading about elves. Yeah, yeah, about very elves. much so. Lord of the right. Rings, you know, and and it was different, you know. And then uh, I, I I remember your your name. You were the the Prince of Chichester. In Gru, uh, I was right? the Prince of Chichester. Yes, <laughs> yes. So that was uh, I must have done something right because uh, you know I'm flipping. You, you know when you edit it, grew and you know Sergio Aragonis, Mark Evanier, um, you know Stan, Stan Sakai, Sakai uh, you know I'm top with... talent. Editing that book, in all honesty, was more or less the book came in totally done, and my work was mostly making sure the pages were in the right order, making sure it was packaged up for the printer. I'd proofread it just in case. So, um, 
but I must have done something right because, you know, I'm flipping through that particular issue <laughs> and like, you know, and I'm reading it and I'm laughing at the jokes. And then suddenly you get to this Prince of Chichester gag and, uh, you know, you do that double take like, wait a minute, what's my name doing in this book? And it's not the credit box at the beginning. <laughs> um, and uh, and so I, I cracked up and then. You know, it wasn't a one-time joke. I no, mean, kept, it was. They, they kept coming back to that joke. They don't again. let a joke die in that book. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't know if that joke still exists, but that Prince of Chichester was a was a a long running gag, as they say. Yeah, yeah, that, that's funny. I, I I was always wondering if 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 you did something to offend them, or if it was just like I like this guy. You you know, I I hope it was that they liked this guy. Um, you know, because when I called up Mark and I I. You know, he said, hey, this is pretty cool. He laughed and, you know, he just, uh, you know, he didn't say, oh, we want to do something nice for you. But I think he just enjoyed the fact of probably, you know, Mark being who Mark is, he probably just saw this long mangled last name and said, we could make a good joke out of this and <laughs> play it out that way. Yeah. And we could get a good eight years out of this kid. Exactly. At least, <laughs> at least. So, you, so you're back into comics now after, after a, 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 a little, a little bit of a, uh, a little time away from from the, a little uh, time away if you yeah. count like 20 20 plus years yeah a little <laughs> time away um the older i get that that's a little time and yeah, and um, i might as well, well we'll we'll throw up your kickstarter right here you you want to tell us anything yeah, about yeah i mean um i i was working on a project for a while with an artist named Carl Waller we've been working on this kind of grindhouse uh truckers from hell idea it's called oh. axles infernal so we <laughs> the idea behind it is that there are not just one hell, but there's many hells. There's a hell from every culture, every point in history that you can imagine. But uh, to be believed in, to continue to have the energy of belief behind them, these hells have to literally deliver hell on earth. So there's a damnation delivery service, in <laughs> essence, and, um, and uh, uh, run by something called the Underworld uh, Transportation Authority. And uh, there's a shipping line, there's an airline, and this is the trucking line. So um, <laughs> uh, a woman named Percy Cross, a young woman named Percy Cross gets sort of shanghaied into working for this. Uh, she doesn't really do this very willingly, but she's our heroine. And she gets pulled into this into this world, into the story to become uh, one of the co-drivers of one of these, these trucks uh, that are delivering hell on earth. So we developed this whole big world and we've got all these multiple storylines going, but this Kickstarter is to get it off the ground. So uh, it's the first issue of what will then be a five issue uh, series. Oh, five and issues. Um, we, we got, a, we got a, a lot of uh, great folks working on it. Wes Wong was the colorist, Comic Craft and Richard Starkness designed the logo. Um, Pat Brousseau uh, was recently nominated for an Eisner, uh, is our letterer. And yeah, um, I love his stuff. And uh, we just uh, just this past weekend uh, kind of got past the uh, the funding goal. So we actually um, it's it's funded. We're trying to kind of push through. Tomorrow at high noon is the absolute last hour. We're almost at seven thousand. If anybody's listening here, yeah, uh, please go check, check it out. out. You know the, the comics are affordable. There's a lot of great rewards and stickers and artwork and variant things and posters and um you know because we hit our stretch goals i'm going to do a dramatic reading of the first issue script <laughs> got a good at voice some point that. That's, that should be fun uh you got so a it should be voice. fun so uh you know folks uh you know please check it out um if you like uh army of darkness uh from dusk till dawn with a little bit of the good place uh thrown in uh it's got that sort of um horror adventure uh wicked fiendish vibe to it that sounds awesome, you know. If 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 uh, I'm, I always wanted to write comics, and my I and then if I couldn't write comics, which I never did, I wanted to be a trucker, which I also. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so this, this is right up my alley. <laughs> this this meshes them together. Yeah, this this sounds great. This sounds awesome. Well, well uh, did this is your first Kickstarter? Did you find it uh, daunting? I found it exhausting, man. Yeah. I I I I um. I mean, we tried to do as much prep as we possibly could. We, which we did. We we talked to a lot of our, you know, fellow uh, uh, professionals, folks who've run successful Kickstarters. Got a lot of great advice. Do this. Don't do this. Um, but even so, you know, you, you launch on the first day, and 
and you suddenly realize, oh, it should be this instead of that. And, you know, and you're constantly uh, changing the rewards up where you can. You're you're highlighting your credits in a different way. Hey, you need a bigger image of, of the variant cover here. So fortunately, people kept weighing in and giving us ways to to shift it around. Um, there's a lot of spam. You know, I, I did not prepare myself for you know, all these people. Uh, hey, we will finance your project if you do this. Yeah. We will promote your project if you if you do this. Yeah, all, I all nonsense. Imagine. Yeah. So um, so that was kind of um, exhausting. I, I I didn't look at it multiple times a day. You know, I check in once a day and add some things or put out some new social posts, but I wasn't clicking, uh, you know, refresh, refresh, refresh every hour. That would have been maddening. Oh, that, I think I, I could only imagine. I, I'm I'm going to be doing a, a crowdfund in, in a couple of months. Okay, later. and I and I, I, I'm, I that's why I'm in, I'm listening to you because I could I'll yeah. be that guy. What, what are you What are you going to do it for? I, I'm writing a, a comic called Heroic Tales. Yeah. My awesome. Own. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I have Renzo Rodriguez doing the art. You know, and I'm seeing p wonderful, beautiful pages coming. In. I feel like crying. That's exciting. It's it's that's exciting. exciting. But I'm at that point where I don't realize what I don't know. So I, you know, so when I hear, you know, when I hear you talk about it, you know, I'm like, oh my and God, am I crazy for doing this? Am I crazy? <laughs> no, I think, I think it's, I mean, uh, please let me know when you're doing it. I'll definitely, you know, give it a push, oh, you. you know, from, from my point of view and, and love to see what you're up to, but you know, it's a great opportunity to do what you're doing and you, you should definitely do it, but you're exactly right. You don't know what you don't know. Right. Until I, I don't you, know what you, I'm in for. I'm in that you, naive stage. I'm, you, I'm I mean, gonna, yeah. And I'm, I'm sure, sure you've looked at it. Right. And you've looked at a hundred different campaigns and you've said, oh, I'm yeah. going to do it like this and I'm not going to do it like this. And then you'll get a lot of stuff right. Maybe you get one thing wrong. Um, and uh, I think that the two things that I took away that I would do differently for what it's worth is, um, uh, you know, we didn't set a high goal. We, we set a goal that was authentic. You know, it was yeah, based it was upon the, goal, yeah. the cost. But you might set a lower, the lowest goal you possibly can, because that will, um, you know, the sooner you're funded, the sooner Kickstarter pushes you, right? They push okay. you more. And so if you're, if you're a winner right away, you know, um, they will, their algorithm will push you higher okay, in their okay. recommendation engine. So the lowest number you can possibly get away with, do that. And then, um, you know, spend, you know, in that, in that preview time, uh, spend as much time as you can getting people to sign up for that initial notice. You know, I did a lot of pre promotion as it were, but we might've uh, waited a little bit longer to get a few more folks in that, um, in that queue before we hit live. Yeah. Uh, Cause there, there's no, there's no, there's no penalty for waiting, you know, when you have that preview part up. Yeah. Uh, but those are two things I might've done a little bit differently. And uh, so, so you hit your funding goal. So, do you think you're you're gonna learn and do number two sooner than rather than later? Uh no. I I th again learning from my friends. Mark McKenna is an, an artist uh, uh, who uh, I stayed friendly with over the years, and he's done a number of successful Kickstarters um, and sub uh, sequential ones. You know, based upon like a series he did. Uh, I think there's probably like a two and a half, three month window where you can go from issue to issue realistically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't talking and, about yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, um, you know, we'll get this one out the door, get the fulfillment done, make sure we don't make any mistakes here. The nice thing about this, again, for folks who are, you know, watching or listening, um, is it's it's done, right? The book is done. Like it, it's not printed yet, but all the art's done, the story's done, the lettering's done, the coloring's done. So your risk is is nil, right? It's not right. like we're going to flake and not do this book. We want to get this first you're thing a, out. You're, you're an established person. You know, you yeah. know I mean? and, and you can find me and kick my ass if, yeah. if you I don't. He doesn't live too far from me, ladies and exactly. gentlemen. Exactly. where we exactly. lived before we started talking. I'm John a construction gonna, worker. I, know, I get this. I'll... <laughs> and, and, and you'll rescind his invitation to his gaming night. But uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah I think no, um, we'll, we'll play any of these games over. We'll play Gloomhaven. Oh, I want to play Scythe again. Let you ever play Scythe? Let's play Scythe. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we want to tell this story. You know, we want right, we right. want we want this five issue initial story, which tells Percy's like kickoff I, adventure. I love, I love the concept. 
this yeah, is it's, a, it's a lot of fun. Everybody we've shown it to and and uh, you know has has seen more than you know what's out there already uh, has given us you know good thumbs up. So that's nice to and that's you not just my mom. House, and then you said trucking. <laughs> yeah. So that is that's, that's it. Just sounds so much fun. Oh man, I again like kicks the the crowdfunding uh, Kickstarter. No, I almost said Indiegogo. You're on Kickstarter. And, we're on uh, Kickstarter, right? Yeah, yep. you're on Kickstarter. Yep. Now, I, I I always wanted to ask this just because uh, it seems like the comic book profession, the comic book industry, is changing right now, and more and more people are, are going to crowdfunding. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I had Eric July on on the channel, and you know when I asked him, he, he looked at me like I was crazy. But do do you find like crowdfunding is that the future? Is this viable? Is is this a stopgap measure? Because let's face it, the 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 mainstream comics like stores are closing and like at the same time, I'm excited because nobody like me can make a comic, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, everybody's a nobody until somebody starts reading it, you know. So that's that's I don't think that's the way to judge yourself. But um, I I I mean I'm not the one to really kind of analyze it because it's not like I've been deeply involved in in comics for a long time. But I think at least producing them or creating them. But I I think. Uh, I mean, I think comics are very vibrant, you know, obviously oh. if there are stores closing, we're also coming off, you know, repercussions from the pandemic and you know, yeah, the economy yeah. and everything else. But when you go into a comic store, um, there are so many really wild titles beyond the, the quote unquote big two, right? right if you yeah. have access to one of those digital uh, comics libraries, like, uh, like Hoopla is something I can get through my local library that has a lot of digital comics. Um, you know, there's so many titles I'd never hear, heard, heard of before that are high quality, exciting, original things. I think people are doing more interesting, exciting, genre bending work in comics than I could ever have imagined. Yeah, in, in I do think it's way. kind of a golden age right now. If, yeah. If you, if you want to put up a little bit of work to look, you, you will it's find there. I, it's I, there. I, I describe this to my friends because me and my friends, we were... 90s punk rockers you know what i mean yep. we had to look for these seven inches and go to different record stores and talk to the guy and oh this band is good and then read an interview with, oh this band like this band you could do that right now and you could go broke buying some really good comics that you know right, so it is right. Exciting. yeah and it's exciting and I, I think um i think a big part of of uh any of the crowdfunding you know in any of these different places is just a great opportunity it's more work though like that's the thing, and that's I think yeah, the challenge yeah. in in you being don't a, a script to Archie and exactly <laughs> the, the, the 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 creator mentality and and it's a and it's an appropriate one because you've done a lot of work creating something is you know now I want I want the world to read it or experience it and I don't have to carry the the weight of doing all the rest of it but crowdfunding demands that you do it you have right. to be the one who pushes it produce it edit it uh, ship it fulfill right. it. But you also have now the opportunity. Nobody maybe at a publisher would have wanted to look at Axel's Infernal, right? I don't know. But now I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to have that, you know, uh, Yeah, you, you're directly to the customer now. I'm directly to the customer. And that there's a oh, lot of potential in that. You can have boxes of comics and you and your wife put them in boxes and send them Oh, yeah. Box. I mean, that's yeah, the that's next awesome. step. I mean, I got to get to get Carl's down Kids in North get home. Carolina. Get home on Christmas yeah. break. We're, we're mailing out comics to people. I <laughs> I mean, Car Carl Waller, the, the my partner and artist on this, you know, he's in North Carolina. I'm in Connecticut. You know, we got to figure out um, the logistics of getting together and, you know, f fulfilling this, like packaging yeah. this stuff up, signing the, uh, you know, the personalized autographs that we ridiculously offered to, to do. <laughs> I, I said the same thing and my artist lives in Mexico. I said, I, you know, I guess yeah, I have to try yeah, you got, Mexico. you got to, you got to plan that stuff ahead, you know? Yeah. So, um, but we'll be doing that. And that's part of the, uh, the experience in figuring it out too. What works, you know, making sure that we calculated the, you know, the shipping costs and all that yeah. nonsense. Right. Isn't, so. isn't that scary? Are, are you, you know, yeah. overseas? How, how do you, how do you estimate that? You know, um, I mean, in my case, I took the easy route road out. I, I, uh, I said no overseas shipping, which probably cut into, um, uh, you know, Hey, North Carolina, Marcus, I'm going to tell Carl to look for you. Yeah. Um, you and, get, get, uh, get right up there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and stop my so, house, we'll play some games. <laughs> but there, you know, there are, 
you know, if you look into it as you get closer, I know there are fulfillment uh, places that for right, a fee that cuts into your expense. Yeah, it I mean, cuts, cuts into, into your expense, cost. but they will cover it for you, and then you know they will calculate it, and then you pass the cost onto the onto the the backer. Right. right. So, you know, uh, and that's a little less hassle for you. But yeah, you 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 now put that out. Um, he actually is planning on going. Carl is uh, uh, going uh, planning on going to this next Heroes Con and I'm trying to get uh, an invite. So uh, if you know anybody there, uh, tell them I want to go. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll solve your problem. You bring all your stuff there and then get it get it signed when you're exactly. <laughs> You said you started going back to conventions. So have, have yeah, you... well, I hadn't been to a convention in in twenty odd years, and um, and then about the the summer, as COVID was kind of starting yeah, to kind of open all, open yeah. up a little, uh, Terrific Con, which is a great convention in uh, in Connecticut. Uh, the guys who run that, uh, Mitch Halleck, um, and uh, and a friend of mine, Spencer Beck, who's an art dealer there uh they invited me to, to come and and you know here here's a table you can sit and and uh and do whatever you're going to do and at first i was like well, what am i going to do i don't really have anything new i don't have anything to, to to um uh you know talk about in terms of that way but i decided to go and i'm glad i did because it was it was even in that everyone was still you know do we shake hands do we touch elbows yeah, do we get within yeah. 10 feet of each other it wasn't hugely populated but it was a convention you, and you the go people, to shake hands, you pull back, and then you just wave. Yeah, and you don't yeah, know what yeah. to do. <laughs> but um, but for me, you know, it was it was a great way to connect with people who seemed really genuinely surprised to see me, uh, and and that I was alive. Maybe, uh, you know, a lot of people were like, "Hey, I never see you at conventions." Like, well, because I haven't done one in like twenty years. <laughs> yeah. But um, but I went to another one the following year, and. Uh, and I think I have like kind of like a standing invitation. And then this last year, uh, GalaxyCon invited me to a couple, um, uh, including one uh, in Columbus, Ohio. So if anybody's listening from Columbus, that area, uh, beginning of December, I'll be I'll be there. And uh, it's been really fun to get kind of get oh, back and you enjoy and, it. And, I do. I I have no, you know, there's no. Um, there's no expectations on me from myself. Like I, I, I just enjoy meeting with people and answering their questions and sometimes explaining who I am. A lot of times people come up and like, who are you? Why are you here? But even though I've got a big banner that says my name and <laughs> as a bunch of Wait, images of stuff I've worked on. Did you, you still tell them Alan Smithy? I'd sometimes tell them I'm Alan Smithy. There's a guy who actually brought me a comic and wanted me to sign it both as, as, DG Chichester and Alan Smithy, which I thought was hysterical. I, I loved um, your movies, by the way. I just they, they were so they're so they're so bad they're good. And <laughs> I remember I, I, I was watching with with an ex girlfriend years ago. There's a documentary called an Alan Smithy film. Yes, and she yes. was like, was I that didn't a documentary? So many movies. What's that? Yeah, was that a yeah. documentary or was it a? Well, it's, it was Eric Idle, so it was goofy. You know, oh, it was it, goofy, it, right? Right. They right. were treating it as if he was a real person. As, as and if it was a real thing, story. right? I didn't know this guy made. I was like, you don't know who Alan Smith? <laughs> famous directors of all time. Amazing. <laughs> so I, I, I forget who I was talking to, but they said in, in this internet age and crowdfunding age, everybody's got to be their own Stan Lee. You know, yeah. and I, I, I've, I've been having for pretty much a year now. I've been having comic creators come on and we talk and stuff. And a lot of them say that they find it difficult that they're writers and then that people, persons, you know, Mm -hmm. Then the, you know, going out and promoting is a really difficult work. You, you, you seem, you know, you came on, started talking you, like you were born to promote. Well, you know? I, I've also got, you know, 20 odd years of working in the advertising and marketing industry where I had to learn how to present okay. to clients and, and internal corporate folks. I think that was a great training ground for me to you know, it, it took me out of my shell, which I, in a lot of ways, you know, it made me, it made me a better professional writer too, because I had to then generate a lot of different, uh, uh, ways of writing, uh, for different projects. But, um, you know, I, I just had to play myself out in, in, a, in a different way. So I, I, those skills I still have. <laughs> so, so for the, for the year, for the past 20 years, when you were really 
work in, 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 the, in the private business? Were you still writing? We, did you always have a writer's bug? Did you no, write you know, a novel that you're, you know, you're going to unleash on the whole world? I, I had the writer's bug, but I was one of those stupid people for 20 years, you know, who says, you know, I got to find time to do this. I got to find time to do this. And, and one of the things um, when I had this last sort of job transition, got caught in a layoff and all these other things was, uh, you know, I had this sort of epiphany of, of stop trying to be somebody else's whatever and be your own thing. Yeah, uh, which is very freeing and uh, and takes work to remain that way. But I think then, you know, new opportunities, John, started to kind of open up when you're more in tune with those sort of things. Right. And I right. think that that I think that I think my comfort level with myself and being and then starting to do more of these creative projects, just, you know, here's a little video I made and here's a, some short stories I wrote and here's. Uh, working on this uh, Axel's Infernal, um, you know, uh, project with Carl. Um, yeah, Geek Hero, Bubba right, there. Right. Yes, yeah. breaking yourself from finding time. Absolutely. It, it is. It is. I always key. said I was going to write a comic someday. I have scripts yeah. written for tw 20 years since I was a right. kid. And, and I, I'm looking right. at myself interviewing people. And my beard's getting longer and gray. I said, you know, and, what, when? Yeah. If not yeah. now, when? You know? And, if not that, that's exactly what I said to myself. Yeah. And, and, geek hero or bubba whichever you prefer I, you know one thing if you keep a calendar like a journal or um uh or or if you have a calendar on your computer here's one thing you can do schedule yourself that time like right. put on two o'clock every tuesday six o'clock every night half an hour right that's where you're going to sit down yeah, and you do tell it yourself so 10 that, minutes that, so it's not intimidating and then you do it for half hour it's exactly it's like lifting weights right you right. can only like struggle at like the two pound dumbbell right. you know on january 1st maybe you're doing the maybe you're yep. doing the three pound you dumbbell you lose dumbbell. weight an ounce at a time right well yeah and that's the way to do it is that you have to build the habit but i i love scheduling time for yourself to do that because right. then the alarm goes off on your phone or your computer or whatever you shut it and off and you go back you're annoyed that it went off well maybe <laughs> <laughs> but if it goes off every day, you finally, you know, you start. Oh, I was thinking like you tell yourself, I'm only going to write for 10 minutes. And then if the 10 minutes goes up and you're like, oh, I'm oh, do oh, oh, that's you know, even and then better. you get annoyed yeah. that the 10 minute alarm. No, off. No, no, I need that, 20 that, minutes. I'm going. Yeah. No, I, no agree with you. I used to tell myself I was going to write for an hour. And then I'm like, I don't want to sit down for an hour. It, that was torture. Yeah. So right, right. I just said five minutes, get a couple right. of sentences. And, and that's, that's not intimidating. And next thing you know, I'm writing pages. Right. But you know, but you'll you know you'll sit four hours and and watch you know uh, uh, you'll binge the you know yeah, Big Bang Theory on Alan Smithy who doesn't even exist. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, I I I I do like I, I I see other people like getting off their ass and making comics, and I'm like, you know, I, I've been reading comics for forty years. What 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 what's stopping me? Like you know exactly, and now and now you're going to do it, which is amazing. yeah. Now I'm going to do it. You know, much to yeah. my uh, checkbook chagrin, but yes, I'm going to do it. <laughs> right, right. You know, but but you you you're going to be excited and thrilled. Oh, I'm, I'm and, telling guys this, at work, and they're just like, who cares? We got we got to chop through this wall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if but, it ain't baseball, uh, the weather, or the current job, they don't want to hear it. But that doesn't right. stop me from telling them. <laughs> no, totally, totally. <laughs> So now you got the comic book writing bug again. You, you, you're you're writing uh, for Marvel again. Uh, well, yeah, Marvel approached me because of those conventions. I was at a convention. Um, guy comes up to me and you know introduces himself to me. He's really super nice. I really liked your work. Uh, oh, by the way, my name is CB Sobolski, and I'm like that name sounds familiar. Oh, you're the editor in chief. Yeah, I know that guy. Where yeah. Do I know that guy? <laughs> <laughs> so my brain doesn't work too quickly sometimes. But uh, uh, you know, so he was the editor in chief of Marvel, and right. uh, and uh, and you know, just uh, I, I jokingly said to him, um, you know, hey, I've been meaning to call you up and pitch you on these things, and then he just turned around and said, well, as a matter of fact, and they had been doing what they called these nostalgia books, where they were bringing back some creators from back in the day, as it were. Yeah. And uh, and offered me a chance to play with Daredevil again. So uh, I, uh, I I I'm no fool, and I said 
yeah, let's, I'll, I'll somehow find time in my schedule. I don't know where I'm going to fit this in, but, uh, you know, we, we went back and forth. I met the daredevil editor. Uh, you know, we had a good conversation and, uh, and started to work out these ideas, which are now, uh, uh, this four issue series called daredevil black armor. It puts him back in the, in the costume from the nineties fall from grace story. Uh, you don't have to have I, read I that story on my desk for years. I don't yeah, <laughs> I have, I have that original one too. And, uh, and, uh, so that's going to start in just a couple, couple weeks now, the day before Thanksgiving, the first cool, one comes out. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I, and I mentioned JM day Mateus, he's got Magneto, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. He's, he's done some great stuff. Howard Mackey just did a, a, a fun, uh, ghost writer story. Oh, I didn't you know, know that. Howard. Oh, cool. Yeah. I, yeah. Howard, Howard had brought ghost writer back in the, you know, in the nineties. And, and so he just did one recently, which I think did very well. And, uh, Peter David had done uh, a number of them. Uh, I'm sure, you know, other, and, Anne had done a, a run on Daredevil not too long yes. ago and Nascenti. Yep. Yes. And, and, and Louis Simonson, I think is doing a, a, an X-Men story. If I'm yes. Talking. Yes. I believe or you're X-Men. right. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I, these are all legends, all legends, you know, the, the, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite a bit flabbergasted that they didn't reach out earlier. You know, I mean, you know, you well, find out I mean, there's a baseball team with Babe Ruth sitting over there and like, why don't we get this guy <laughs> up at bat? You know, you got, you got yeah, these yeah, proven yeah. sellers, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, you got a lot of just read clearly, clearly years. talented people working, you know, nowadays. And I, I think, um, you know, some of the, th- some of it also just comes around to the right time, right? Some right, of the people right. now who are making the decisions grew up reading some of these comics, you know, so when I, when we did that costume, uh, you know, back in the, in the nineties, uh, you know, uh, Scott McDaniel and who, who created the visual look of the costume, you know, he was my partner on Daredevil when, when we did that storyline, uh, we took a lot of flack for that costume. There are a lot of people who well, did not like that costume. You know, um, but, I, I got to say comic book readers are prickly pears. Exactly. But, well, but I think a lot of the, you do, you're going to get crap, you know, you're you, going to get crap. You're going to get Frank crap. Miller probably got a lot of, lot of heat for Dark Knight, you know, returns. You know what I mean? Well, I don't know about Dark Knight returns, maybe some of the later ones, but yeah, uh, yeah. All right, um, I that. think Dark Knight returns <laughs> was, was kind of universally loved, but, uh, right. but my point being, I think a lot of those people who, who did like the costume are now either making the decisions. They're the editor, they're the editor in chief or, or, you know, there seems to be a, a good buzz online, at least the people who, you know, contact me. There was only, you know, when, when the news came out, there were a lot of fun little articles. And then there was one, you know, uh, worst writer comes back with worst costume ever. So that was a good, that was, <laughs> oh, that was a good headline just to oh, kind of make sure to have your breakfast in the morning. <laughs> well, that though, that was good because, you know, you get the ones that are like, you know, legendary writer and legendary costume and, and then you need the, you need that one that sort of just brings you back down to earth. The same paper. It. Keep it. Yeah. Exact. Keep you humble. Keep, Keep you, humble. you humble. Keep you humble. Yep. Yeah. Gene Colan didn't like it. I didn't realize that, that. that's okay. the first I'm hearing about it. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I didn't, know I, that I didn't like it either. I didn't, I don't want to say anything, but you know, <laughs> I, you know, sorry, Frank, there, there goes my chances of him ever coming on my channel. I love <laughs> you. you edit, that. <laughs> edit, that, edit that out. Yeah. yeah. Edit that part out. <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because I, when they put Spider-Man in the black costume, I was working right. at a comic book store at the time. And I, I, I had my long hippie hair at the time. I'm like, what are they doing? This, you don't oh, rest with a Steve right. Ditko design. Man. I was like, apparently, apparently you do, right? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? And then I was like, calm down. They're gonna bring them back. They're gonna bring back the like, like you know, like I look back at how it. Re- I reacted to it. You know, like it's just a comic book, but you know, right. it shows you how right. much we love it. You know, we we well, love yeah, people get passionate about it and they think it can't change and. um but, you know, but then they always want things to change. You know, people are always like, well, why aren't you doing something new and daring and different and, and whatever else? And, and then when you do it, then you take, take flack for it. But um, I think you have to, you have to get to a point where you let the story tell you what the story is going to be. And right. then you again are kind of like a shepherd. Like I was saying, when I was an editor, I felt I was a shepherd for the, the, the other creators. And, um, I think when you're a writer, uh, I often feel like when I'm doing the job the right way, 
I'm a shepherd for the character. The, the character is telling me what to do. And that's, sometimes that's the character is telling you things that you don't expect. Um, that, and if you challenge it, you know, it doesn't go as well. But when you kind of like let it go, where's this taking me? Uh, it, it goes to really kind of cool places. I, I had Chuck Patton on a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, and, Chuck's a great guy. Oh, what a great guy. I could have talked to him all night long. Oh, what a great guy. He, he, he was telling me that he got a lot of flack for the Detroit Justice League. He, he became the, the scapegoat for that. And he said it really bothered him. And now he's like, you know how much fan mail I get? People love it. They're like, that's my Justice League. You know, mm -hmm. they, they, unfortunately, the, the haters are louder than, than the lovers, you know. You know, and now he's just like he'll go to a convention and people are like, oh, you know, with, with a picture of Gypsy and Vibe. And I love right. these characters. They're so, and I told him, and it was the truth. That's when I started collecting the Justice League. You know, I was like, that that's my Justice League. And he was like, oh, no, now you're flattering me. I'm like, no, really? You know, <laughs> so it's funny. At one point, awesome. all the, the loudmouths are complaining and then they go away. And the, and 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 the fans stay, so you know. And the fans <laughs> and the fans come of age, or they stick around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I know that. That's why I, I approached you to come when I, when I saw the reaction to to Dead Devil Black. But you know, people like, oh wow, you know, I like. I was, I was like, all right, I, I, you know, do I dare approach? You know, Dan. Yeah. Now that I could call worst, you Dan. <laughs> worst, worst I would have said was no, right? Right. You know, that's that be... it's funny because people are like, how do you get such good guests? I said, I just ask them. I yes. said, I'm not, I'm not going to mention how many people said no. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the story I always tell is back in college, I was, you know, one of these guys who couldn't get a date, and I just went up to the hottest girl and I asked her out, and she said yes. Ever since then, that's been my philosophy. Just, just that's ask. It. Just ask. Right. You know, I've been asking right. for jobs that I shouldn't get. <laughs> you know, I've been asking for, you know. Mm -hmm. My wife married me. <laughs> there you go. She See? Caught on that you made the wrong choice. The yes, the yes is the right yeses make up for many no's. Yep, yep, yep. You miss you miss every uh, swing you don't take, right? That's right. There you yeah. go. So, so I, I think that I think that's great that you, you're you're back in comics. You're writing Daredevil. You, you got a Kickstarter now. Like, is yeah. this it? Now? Are are you missed? Are you back in comics full time? Is this it? No, I mean I I I would be nice if comics would pay every bill but that's not going to happen <laughs> uh so i mean i i have a lot of marketing work you know the advertising work uh, the type of work i do for those clients is still my oh. bread and butter but this is a nice extension of things to do uh, whether there's going to be other ones beyond this i'm black box comics which is a, a small uh smaller independent uh a, a publisher with a lot of titles actually um, have offered me um, a sort of a, uh, a near future uh, thriller that they're putting together. So oh, we've cool. developed something. Uh, they haven't come out with um, the details around that yet, but that's something that I've actually written five a five issue story on. Oh, uh, cool. So it's being illustrated, uh, and I might be doing something uh, else for them as well. So that'd be fun. They're nice people to work with, uh, and they're giving me some different genres to play with, but. Uh, uh, so there's at least, I think, uh, two other things on the horizon, you know, beyond these. Um, but I, again, I feel if you open yourself up to the opportunity, uh, sometimes the opportunities come to you. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I just, you know, you know, I talk about this quite often, but you know, I've never like during COVID I, I was, I moved, you know, we, mm -hmm. I was living in. New York City, and it just got weird and things, you know. So mm. I, had to, I had to move. I moved out here into the woods. I didn't know anybody, so I was like, "I'm going to start a YouTube channel and talk to people about comics." And yeah. For yeah. for a year, it was me talking. Oh, I like Tiger Man, you know. And then right. nobody watching my stuff, and here I am now. I'm talking to you, you know. <laughs> so yeah, you, know, you got yeah. more comfortable, probably. People, uh, you know, saw your stuff and probably started to enjoy I would it. See you. Want to look at my early videos? <laughs> I'm, They're I'm, always... I'm shy and I didn't know what to say. You know, my wife would come down and say, "Don't come down." <laughs> You're all embarrassed. I, I have a good friend um, who uh, does sort of like uh, I'll say business coaching. You know, it's kind of his business, and uh, and and he was trying to kind of get his own thing going for the for the longest while. And his initial his videos now are so much him. They're so like they're just natural, right? And but his initial ones were all these kind of awkward things yeah, trying to I introduce himself <laughs> yeah or or for a while he was posing in front of 
beautiful mansions and trying to look successful and but now he's he found his groove i think just because he was himself and again yeah. i think that's that that comes across the lens knows well you can't you can't you know you can't fool youtube for too long you know no no and you can't fool yourself either you have to be comfortable with what you're doing so be, uh, before we were went live you're also a board gamer yeah, I, you you broke up a little bit there, John. Before we went live, Dan and I were talking that you're you're also a board gamer. You was looking at yes, game. yes. I mean, not not to your level, but uh, you know, we became as a family kind of kind of hooked on board games over the years, and you know, started fun, to pick up. It? it it's it's great. It's a great way to spend time together. It's some some of them are just so imaginative you know we went through the uh, the munchkin stuff we we got hooked on the whole forbidden uh you know island forbidden desert you know uh, uh you know type of series i love the cooperative games uh, are are so much fun my my wife you know loves the uh the betrayal games <laughs> especially when you get in those yeah. betrayal is you go into like a hospital and you play in the game, you don't know if you're building the board as you play, and then someone yes. becomes that guy. One like they will become a vampire, and you don't know this play. That's the beauty of it. Then you got to look up at the chart, and then you got to yep. read the rules really quick. It could fall apart yep. if, if the wrong becomes the monster. They don't really totally, totally. You know, yeah. but, but that, yeah. that's the fun part about that game. I played that game, and I didn't know it. I came to bed guy, and I had to screw it around. You, you turn into an error. You're like, I'm a monster. It's a fun game. It turns yeah, it all think, around. Uh, those yeah. those have been yeah betrayal at uh, haunted hill or something like that. You know, was a was a terrific haunted, one. Betrayal on haunted mansion or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's like it. you're you're building the whole thing as you go along. Um, and then the and, version and, where as you play every time you play, you have an inspiration. So and, and you can rip up cards and add new cards. So like. It, but by the time you're done playing it, it's completely different than any other person. Totally, totally trail. different, totally different approach. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, we just, it's just so much fun. You just have to make sure you have people to play play them with. Sometimes you know I yeah. buy them and then I have to find. You oh, know. Connecticut's not too far away from me. I'm in Suffolk County. That's I'm, it. That's what you're saying. It's not far yeah. Ferry, you know. <laughs> we'll break out Nemesis, which is basically exactly. Oh God, <laughs> that was that was that was demented and uh, intense fun, but. Um, all right, I'm, I'm gonna get going now because I gotta go to bed early, and I and I All right. try to just just to an hour because after an hour it kind of fades. So anything you want to say, we'll 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 talk. I'll put up. No, here. no. Like, listen. Thank you again for the invitation. Oh, I uh, it. Believe me, know, if I didn't have to work in the morning, I'd keep you here till midnight talking. <laughs> um, but uh, no, good con good chat. Uh, you know, again, folks, we got the last um, uh, twelve four. Oh. 16 hours, 16 oh, hours so of my kick, you you Kickstarter left. So it uh, ends at noon tomorrow. Go to this URL, check it out. Uh, fun story. Carl's artwork is off the charts. Uh, uh, I'm sure you're going to find something to enjoy in the story, the art, yeah, the rewards. Like and um, and truckers, and, man, this sounds awesome. <laughs> and then, uh, and then keep an eye out. Uh, for Daredevil, you know, coming back uh, with my name on it um, uh, right before Thanksgiving. I can't possibly, I won't get the drumstick, but I got a new comic book. So that's uh, <laughs> as, as close as I get to a Thanksgiving miracle. So uh, yeah, yeah. hopefully, and and let people, you know, uh, hit me up on, on what's left of Twitter or, or Instagram and let me know what you think of them as well. Like I'm, sure. I'm, I'm DG Chichester on both of those. Yeah. And, and thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. It's, 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 it's such a blast. You know, to, 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 to me, and it's such a joy to, to meet the people behind these comics that you loved and then find out that they're nice, pleasant people. Hopefully. You know? <laughs> we so try. I try. You know, either you're a good actor or you're a nice guy. You know, it's because uh, I get I get so nervous. Like, what if this guy's a jerk? You know, but uh, it's so much fun. It's so great. You know, the guys at work will tell me they met some rock star. They met David Bowie or whatever. And I'm like please don't tell me he was a jerk. Please don't. And oh, he was the greatest guy, you know? So, right. Right. I, always get, right. I, I don't get nervous that I'm going to stutter. I always get nervous that, you know, whatever. Now I'm babbling. I'm babbling, but 
We're thank good. you so We're much. Good. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming on. If you ever want to come back again, just just ask. You know, I I I, I don't know. I'm I, I'm beaming. I'm beaming from 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 ear to ear. You know. So thank happy. you, John. Thank no, thank glad you everybody. Had a good time. And remember, you got till twelve noon tomorrow. You, it's it. it's Grindhouse house and truckers. This 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 That's comic is made for me. <laughs> All right, folks. Take it I easy. Bye, everybody. Be well.